So Gail, I'm so delighted you've been able to join me for a conversation um, with Women's Aid Ireland uh, around the key issues that you work on and the insights that you can share into your experience. Um, so what I would love uh, for us to just kick off in our conversation is if you could just share a little bit about your own background and uh, you know why and how you came to set up an organization like Culture Reframed. Okay, so um, I've actually been studying, researching and writing and lecturing about the effects of pornography for well over 30 years. And what happened around 2000 is that things got so much worse because of the internet becoming domesticated. And then in 2007, things got so much worse because you've got the free porn sites. So I was going around lecturing and um, I was leaving people. You could see their faces afterwards. They looked like they didn't know what to do with themselves. You could see they looked absolutely terrible afterwards. And it is a lot to talk, you know, to digest. So I remember standing there in the, you know, on the podium thinking, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep lecturing and leave them nowhere to go. It's just not fair. So it so happens at the same time I was speaking before a philanthropy organization and it was a woman's philanthropy organization and a group of women came up to me and they said, you know, we're philanthropists and we want to give you money, quite a lot of it, to start a nonprofit. And like, how often does that happen in anyone's lifetime? Right. So I kind of had a crossroads in my life you know am I going to continue being a professor and lecturing as I am or am I going to start a non-profit and I've got the money and again this is never going to happen again so I made a decision that I became a professor emerita which means I'm not teaching mm -hmm. and I um, decided I'm going to start an organization to help parents so that was the original thing to help parents so um, we got together top draw consultants from the public health perspective, which means you bring together all sorts of groups who normally don't speak to each other. That's the great thing about public health. The silos are gone. And we sat down and we said, okay, let's think what is the most effective way to deal with this? Because parents need to talk to their kids about pornography before the porn industry does. Mm. So we decided we would build programs for parents to actually help them have these conversations. So a year and a half later, and many dollars later, uh, and after eight consultants writing parts of the program, we had the Parents of Tweens program on Culture Reframe website. And anyone who wants to see it just has to go into Culture Reframe and go to the Parents program. And um, it took off like wildfire because there's nothing like it. And we had such a response from that that we actually got a grant from another foundation to do a Parents of Teens program. Mm. So then we worked on that. So the goal was really to say to parents originally, you know, we're going to hold your hand through this. We're going to show you exactly what's going on. And then at the end of the program, we even have conversation scripts written out that you can have with your kid around pornography, sexting, safety online, body image. There's 12 of them up there. And um, then what we found is that actually, because there's nothing like it in the world, suddenly we've got therapists coming at us, educators, the legal profession, the medical profession, and they're using these programs in their trainings, domestic violence shelters, rape crisis centers. So it's now all over the world. In terms of the context, in terms of the issue of porn itself, you, you and your colleagues actually refer to what you're calling a porn crisis. So what do you actually mean by that? Well, if you look at studies, um, the first time mainly a boy gets to porn is anything between eight to 11 years of age. Okay. And, and a lot of people don't realize this, you know, there's no playboy penthouse hustler anymore on the free porn sites. They're gone. The free porn sites now are, are only violent, hateful, degrading, misogynist pornography. That's all that gets produced by the main industry. So, what happens is that, and there's no safeguards, of course, around age or anything. So what happens is, you know, you find that kids, you know, as they grow into adolescence and they're sexually interested, they put in stuff and they come, they end up at Pornhub because it's free and there's no age or you porn or X hamster, the major porn sites. And they're catapulted into a world of sexual torture. Now that's a crisis on a number of levels. The first one, let's take the boy, is that he thinks maybe he's going to get a pair of breasts. 
if he puts butts or tits or something into, into Google. What he's not prepared for is to be catapulted into a world where women are being choked, that's with a penis down the throat, strangled, hit, um, you know, penetrated by anything from three to five men, oral, anal, vaginal and everything, um, and then ejaculated on all over the face as she's being called every name you can imagine. So I want us to think about that 11 year old boy. What's happening to him? Because this is a form of child sexual abuse. To have to look at that at that early age. And so I would argue on the boy's side, we're traumatizing a whole generation of boys. And we know that by the age of, I think 16, like 70 odd percent of boys have masturbated more than once to hardcore porn, but it's getting lower and lower and lower. So then you go into the domino effect of what does that mean? What you're doing is you're teaching boys and you're de developing a type of sexual template that is based on the degradation and violence against women. And so now that what we found, and this is all backed up by peer reviewed empirical evidence, is that um, we know, for example, in one study, boys who were frequent users of pornography, that's daily, over 75% of them said they want to try out the images they see, the scenes and the sex acts. So we know that the collateral damage downstream is girls, yeah. right? This is how it works. And then of course, let's get a more macro understanding, the culture, because these boys who have been trained on sexual violence, and remember, they're not just looking at it, they're, they're actually um, masturbating to it, which has a powerful effect on the brain and the way the neurons fire and wire. So what, what are these boys when they grow up and they are now growing up into, you know, sort of their twenties and thirties, the first generation, what kind of men, what kind of fathers, what kind of partners, what kind of politicians, doctors and lawyers are they going to be where their sexual template was formed by hardcore pornography? And we're beginning to see exactly what they are. I mean, there's a ton of empirical evidence out there of how the earlier you get to porn, the more likely you are to be depressed, anxious, sexually harassed, rape, and now erectile dysfunction. We're finding studies on that. It, pornography undermines the social, emotional, cognitive, and sexual development of boys. And when you do that with boys, the girls are gonna pay for this, as they are indeed. So this is why it's a crisis. It's, it's on a macro level, it's a crisis. And on a micro level with the kids, it's a crisis. And it's everywhere. I mean, it is everywhere. You can't go onto a gaming site and not go to porn because they actually build algorithms and drop them into the gaming site. You can't go on Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok and not end up on porn. So we actually, these kids are drenched in porn images and that's the crisis. And we've never before brought up a generation of kids on hardcore porn. So really this is an experiment. And I don't know about you, but I didn't sign up for this. No. And neither did the kids, and neither did the parents, and neither did the society. The work of culture reframed, you articulated um, as being kind of a three-pronged approach. So you've got your raising awareness, you've got your building knowledge, skills, and confidence, and you've got the promoting social change. I wonder, could you just say a little bit about kind of what the thinking behind that, that those three, that triangulation is, and what that looks like in practice? I know you've spoken a little bit already about the training, yes. but, you know, some of the other work, yeah. So what it looks like in practice is, first of all, we're building awareness, skills, confidence, et cetera, in parents and professionals so that they can build resilience and resistance in kids to pornography. Now, again, when you think about the kid at the center, think about all the adults that the kid intersects with, from parents to caregivers, to teachers, to uh, pediatricians, the family courts, you know, if there's a family that is go, enters the social services and ends up going through family courts, all along the way, none of these people who deal with this kid know what's going on. They have to be, they have to be educated first and foremost. And in fact, what um, public health research shows is that the most important people in bringing up obviously healthy, robust adults are the, the parents. So that's why we called it the, you know, program for parents but um, we see it in a kind of imaginative circles so we move outwards from the parents 
to the pediatricians, to the teachers, all of these groups. And then none, we cannot do this just child by child, parent by parent, pediatrician by pediatrician. We have to get to systemic change. And what we do at Culture Reframed, as well as doing all of these other things, is we give lectures, we um, consult to government bodies, um, a lot of the major um, child protection agencies. Um, I've worked with the American Academy of Pediatrics, mm -hmm. the CDC, which is the main um, medical um, body in the United States. We're working with the Association of Judges now to train them. So we're getting to really high levels of systemic change. Mm -hmm. And what we want them to do, and I'll, I'll give you an example for pediatricians. What we've been working with is, there's a well child visit here every year, and it lasts anything from 15 minutes to an hour, depending on you know insurance. And we're working with pediatricians to figure out ways to ask kids, teens and tweens, in their well uh, child visit about the use of pornography. Mm -hmm. This has to be done very carefully because the kid will clam up immediately. So we're working with very skilled pediatricians who have been doing this in their field, in their own clinics for years, mm -hmm. is how do you bring this up? And in order to do that, you have to explain to the parents as well, we're gonna to talk to your kid about porn. You know, pornography is the only above ground multi-billion dollar industry that is completely unregulated, yeah. completely, right? So it's about time the governments all over the world grew a backbone and started doing what needs to be doing, which is regulating this predatory industry that is undermining the well-being of our next generation. In Ireland, we have an, an amazing opportunity right now where we have a, a third national strategy to combat domestic, sexual and gender-based violence. It's looking for the first time at trying to address that uh, across four pillars. So you've got um, prevention, uh, which we'll come back to in a second, protection, uh, prosecution, and then coordinated policy. And I'm just wondering, kind of honing in on that systems change piece, which I think is, is probably the hardest nut to crack on any issue um, that you might be trying to effect uh, an evolution on. In your experience, what, you know, have been the, the, the top, say, three max strategies to overcome in, in trying to tackle the issue of pornography at that kind of systems level? And what's been your kind of your, your best strategy in terms of advising us as we're embarking on this? So we have found that the best way to do this is when we get the request for to do a lecture, is we then hone in and say, we want to continue this work with you. We don't think one lecture is enough. And you know what? After one lecture, they agree. It's that there's such a crisis that they need help and they need training. So I think the best thing is to do is to start going. If they're not coming to you, you go to them, right? You start knocking on doors, you start it, you go to, to high level, you find out who are the really high level bodies out there that can actually have the teeth to do something. And um, you educate them on the harms. You can't knock on doors without fully educating all the stuff. Um, and they are increasingly amazingly grateful and open to what you've got to see, do because they don't know what to do. They have no idea. But you know, mm -hmm. if you've been working in the field, you know what to do. I would say one of the most important things at this moment is getting countries all over the world to pass the age verification legislation. Mm -hmm. Right now, what this is, and it's law now in, in the UK, and what this is, is that, and it works different ways in different countries. So I'm just going to give you the broader sense. So anyone who wants to go on a porn site, anybody has to go through a third party with ID and they have to get in some places it's a digital chip, in other places it's an ID number, and you are not allowed onto that porn set, no, onto that porn site, nobody is until they've uploaded their chip, digital chip, or whatever it is you get. Now, it, the best you've got now to add on to that, you have to, the teeth in this is that if the porn site is found to be out of compliance, then you have to start fining them very heavily. And if they're still out of compliance, then you should drop them at the IP level. I mean, you said it yourself already. You're talking about a multi-billion euro, multi-billion dollar industry. You're not going to take 
that kind of thing lying down. What are your thoughts on getting into spectrums and nuance? Like, is there any good porn? Uh, just yeah, your no. thoughts on that. No, by definition, there can't be because porn is based on the exploitation and degradation of women. So, and I have never seen porn that doesn't include that. And, you know, people often ask me about feminist porn and I have scoured the web, right? There is nothing. It's, it's basically a niche market of the porn industry. It's a PR uh, con, right? But I'll come back to that in a minute. So let's talk about the definition of porn. One of the things I found over the years, and my colleague Bob Jensen says the same thing, it's called a definitional dodge. Everybody wants to talk about definitions. So we can spend years figuring out definitions, okay? My argument would be, if they say they're a porn site, believe them, right? I mean, if you want to buy a car, you're not going to go to the bakery, right? You can go to a car place. Um, so we're talking about the porn sites that advertise themselves as porn sites, okay? And given that the industry is now so concentrated at the point of distribution, not so much at the point of production, but distribution is where it's all at. That's where the money is made. There's one company in the world that dominates the distribution of the vast majority of porn, and that's called MindGeek. That's housed in Canada, okay? And any and their porn sites, Pornhub is their sort of flagship site. So what I would say is there's an industry. You don't need a definition. Just listen to them. This is pornography. Right now, we can argue, and it will get trickier, that we have to figure out what to do about the social media platforms. Mm. But I would say, be, before we get into that, let's first get the age verification law up and running, and then let's get into how we're going to stop the porn on um, all of the social media teen sites. Gaming sites are terrible places for porn as well. So um, I would argue that you know. You know, when you see a woman being sexually degraded, it's very clear it's pornography, you know, in a sexual way. It's, and you, we know it, right? And the feminist movement has spent a lot of time talking about how porn is actually based on that degradation. Porn only works for men to the degree that you degrade with them, right? Now, there are other sites that claim they're not pornographic. OK, and that is not there's a few of them and you have to pay for them and they're not as hardcore. The reality is, let's just step back a minute, is the question is, do we really want a culture where women's bodies are commodified and monetized for the sexual use of men? Because if the answer is yes, then that means we're going to have to accept rape, battery, trafficking, all of those things. If, however, we decide that women deserve human rights, real, that we are human and we deserve those rights, then the answer has to be no. No, we cannot live in a society, we cannot hope for any form of equality when women's bodies are monetized and commodified for sexual purposes. A certain response to those who may kind of oppose porn and indeed sometimes also prostitution is included in, in, the, in the conversation as being kind of anti-sex and frigid and, you know, that kind of backlash that you yeah. can uh, see on social media platforms, places yeah, like yeah. that. In terms of a strategy around that, is that, you know, is that something to engage with? Is it something Absolutely. where your energy is better spent elsewhere? What are your thoughts on that? No, I do think you need to engage with it. And I'll tell you why, um, because um, it is the dominant ideology amongst young people, thanks to the porn culture and the porn um, PR machine, that, you know, pornography is empowering, it's fun, it can be all of these things. Actually, if you want, we, I would say that I am anti-porn because I'm pro-sex. Mm -hmm. You can't be pro-porn and pro-sex, okay? You have to make a decision because if you want to see any anti-sex images, just go to any porn site. That's where the anti-sex is. So this is just, again, another very clever PR tool to basically bludgeon us into silence. This is, this is all made up. The feminist movement, which was the leader in this, because we were the first to define it as harm. That's what's crucial. We were the first, and they, mainly in the 70s, I wasn't, you know, I was too young for that time, but um, the women who started the movement, from Andrea Dworkin to Catherine McKinnon, they re reframed the whole concept of porn away from a punchline in a joke towards understanding the harms done to women and children at the point of production and consumption. 
what kind of conversations do you find are helpful in, you know, because obviously, you know, telling young people you shouldn't, it's bad, you know, that's, yeah, you know, yeah. this, is, this is coming down to your reframing piece. How do yeah. you reframe this for them in a way that connects with them? Okay, so first of all, young people hate to be lectured to. So what um, is said in the um, sex ed world is do not have 100 minute conversation, have 101 minute conversations. All right, so this is an ongoing conversation. And I would start as young as possible, all right? But I'm not talking about porn, you start scaffolding. Um, for example, when I was bringing up my son, very early on, we started using words like sexism, misogyny. I mean, by four or five, these words were coming out of his mouth, right? He would come home and complain that one of his friends had been sexist that day at five years old. So you have to provide them with the vocabulary, first of all. And the younger they are, the more likely they are to actually internalize that vocabulary and understand what sexism and patriarchy is. Um, and kids are capable of doing that, I can tell you. You just have to do it in a way that's age appropriate. When it comes to pornography, I think what the thing that kids hate is being manipulated, right? T adolescents hate being manipulated. So I would explain how the porn industry is manipulating them because they're building algorithms directly for them. These kids think it's their choice to go look at porn. They don't understand just how much energy and effort has gone in to building those algorithms to drag the kids into porn and send them onto Pornhub or whatever. So what I would talk about is, um, and again, you can go on the Culture Reframe website because we've got all the conversations up there, is to talk about body image, body limits, um, the sense of bodily boundaries. And this is especially important for boys. You know, we always say to girls about, you know, the boundaries or often talk about that. We never tell boys that they too have bodily boundaries and that basically being masculine isn't about how many women or girls you can have sex with or you can, um, you know, sexually um, harass or whatever. You, I think it's very important to remember in this conversation that kids are hungry for this. They don't feel comfortable with this. We found that when we go out and lecture, and often when I lecture to kids, well, this is be for about 15 on, and I say to them, does anyone help you in any way navigate your way through the porn culture? And they all say, no, and we're drowning, we're drowning. They can't get enough of this information. I've been in schools where we've, you know, I've been talking to them and I, we talk about hypersexualized images. I don't show porn. I show mainly cosmopolitan and things like that and then explain how it goes on. And I've been in schools where there's almost been um, a coup against the teachers because it's the end of my time and they have to go back to class and the kids won't go back to class. They say, we want more, we want more. So I'm often extending the lecture and they're canceling classes because these kids are so hungry. So it is our obligation to start having these conversations. Now, what's gonna be made easier by this, as well as our parents program that walks you all the way through this, is we are now, we have a team building out a sex ed program on our site, which is gonna be free, which is for anyone who teaches sex ed in any setting. And it's, it's gonna be sex ed with a porn critical lens all age appropriate and they'll even there'll be a whole manual for the teachers on how to do it and then there will actually be lesson plans for them with powerpoints to talk about with the kids so that's going to be at the end of the year so we've built the, our job is to build as many resources as possible to help those people who go out from whether they're parents whether they're pediatricians whether they're child protection so that but I think the most important thing I would say is listen to the kid. Ask them, is there anything you've seen online that makes you feel uncomfortable, right? And then start the conversation there and really listen. Don't start lecturing or preaching. And you will find that they have seen things that are sitting in their stomach, kind of um, marinating, that has made them feel very uncomfortable. So let them make the first move. You have to ask the first question. But from there, you, then you start building on about the harms of porn. And one of the things to really explain to young people is that the more porn you use, the worse sex you're going to have. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, That's yeah. really important. Right? If you think, because porn is the major form of sex ed today. So kids, especially boys, are going to have to tell, this is going to turn you into a terrible sex partner mm -hmm. right? because you're going to get no clue on what women want. 
So that's a really powerful thing. And then for girls, what we found is that there's actually studies out now about this, is they go, about a third of the um, viewers, kids in porn is girls. And what studies show is that very few go on the porn sites to masturbate. They go on to see what the boys are looking at so they can do porn sex with the boys. And they are terrified. They are scared to death. And what studies are showing is that actually quite a, a significant minority are actually putting off sex altogether because they're scared. Now, we don't want that for our kids. We want them to think of sex as something warm and fun and, you know, relational. Um, you know, healthy sexuality is part of being a healthy adult. It's a critical part. And often sex education scares them. You're going to get pregnant. You're going to get STIs, all of that. We need to get them to understand, especially girls, that sex should be pleasurable. And when mm. studies show that when girls are taught that sex should be pleasurable for them, they're much more likely to put off their first sexual experience. They're less likely to be victimized because they've got a sense that they have a right to sexual pleasure, not simply it's all about him. So, uh, Dr. Geldines, we, we could chat all day and I'm just so sorry we don't have the time to do it, but I want to come back and just ask you one, one question to leave us with here. You've uh, articulated in, in this short time, just the damage, uh, the harm that porn can do to uh, boys and girls sexuality, but also in your book, Pornland, you go into a great deal of detail around how it is damaging, not just for women's sexuality, but also adult men. Um, part of our movement is around engaging men in the work to combat all forms of uh, violence against women. And porn obviously is something that we're keen on building those alliances with men on. I just, what advice would you have for us in terms of you know, the success of engaging and, and bringing men on board as allies with us? So I would suggest a number of things. The TEDx talks by men who have talked about why they give up porn. Ran Gavrielli is a very good one. He talks about why he, what he was doing to him and what made him do it. Also, there are um, sites um, called NoFap, which is a really good support group for men who want to stop using porn. And generally, I would explain to men, I, what, what I find the most effective when I go out to colleges and I've given a lecture about pornography and, you know, virtually every guy in the audience has used porn. There's, it would be almost impossible to find you. And I say to them, you know, is this who you want to be? When you look in the mirror, do you want to think you are a man who gets off? on women being humiliated and degraded and debased. Is this who you really want to be? And I have to say there's a gasp in the room because most of them don't want to be. And they don't know that this is what they're doing, that they are def to basically defining a sexual template around misogyny. And, you know, we have to have faith that this is not who men are. Right? We have to have faith that men want to be as fully human and connected and intimate in their relationships as women are. So I think I would say to men, just, just take an inventory, ask yourself who you are, and then think about how the porn industry is training you to go against your own moral compass. Because I don't believe this is who you are. And this is very, very effective because you're not blaming and shaming the men. You're blaming and shaming the porn industry. And that's very powerful. Yeah, Dan, that's a great sign off. I um, want to draw attention to any of our viewers to your own TEDx talk. Um, can you tell us where we can find that? Yeah, just go onto YouTube, put Gail Dines TEDx. Uh, and I definitely suggest that um, people go and look at Culture Reframed.org. It's the, the most, um, I would say, research-based, engaging, not just the programs, but the, our whole website to really get to understand the core of what is going on. Yeah, Dines, thanks very much. Thank you.